Coming up on this week, computer hardware, the PC ain't dead. Well, duh. Intel's making money. Corsair's delightful 760T, the Asus Z97 workstation motherboard, new Raspberry Pis, and the Hummingboard. Oh, and Ryan's giving away 30 grand of free hardware at QuakeCon. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 276, recorded July 17th, 2014. PCs ain't dead, people. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you the most useful, most informative, most helpful, most delightful, and most hands on information, enthusiasm, and news in the hardware community. I'm Patrick Norton, and I am joined from beautiful Tejas in the United States. <laughs> Are you in Dallas, Tejas? I'm in Dallas, and it's not beautiful at all. Um, <gasps> that is, we've had horrendous thunderstorms and like flash flooding and all kinds of stuff. Um, in fact, it was, it was so cloudy and overcast that I, when I walked up like to the 24th floor to go to the breakfast area, I looked out the window, it looked like it was in Taipei. It was like cloudy and overcast and gray. And I was like, where, where am I? This does not look like the Dallas, Texas that I've ever seen before. Uh, <laughs> but, um, the and, but it kept the temperature down at least. So there's well, that. That's good. Yeah. There's something we said for thunderstorms in the summer, keeping the temperatures down, assuming, of course, they don't yeah. blow your house out the landscape and into the local uh, river. Um, man, well, stay inside, stay warm, and stay on the second floor of the hotel. Mm -hmm. QuakeCon, dude. <laughs> what's what's going on at QuakeCon? Obviously, Quake is going on at QuakeCon. You, of course, are talking about hardware. And if I'm not mistaken, there is a giant wall of giveaways behind you. Could you could you just move to the – just oh. – yeah. Oh, oh, come on. Pan the camera a little bit because it keeps I, going. Let's see. Yeah. You can do it. And there's actually there's actually more stuff on the other walls as well that just came in today that we didn't stack up. We stacked it up here because we recorded our podcast last night. So we wanted to use it as a backdrop as well. Right. And then uh, some other shipments come in today. And we've actually got a couple of shipments coming in tomorrow as well. I think all total we have somewhere around thirty three thousand dollars worth of hardware that we're giving away via I'm raffles. Sorry. Uh, How do, okay, so basically, Saturday. I go to QuakeCon. I I fill out. Do I buy a ticket? Do I do I automatically? It's free. Edit if if you're not if you don't want to if you're not going to be in the BYOC, you can. There's a free registration, which just lets you go in and look at the exhibit hall, mm -hmm. uh, where there are companies like MSI and Gigabyte and uh, Intermax and Inwin, uh, and you can go to any of the sessions that are out here as well. Ours is on Saturday the 19th at uh, uh, noon, and um, you know. Central time, noon central time. And you just get in line and we'll pass out tickets as everybody walks in and then we draw names and uh, you can win prizes. We're going to do a system build contest as well where two people will have identical parts and the first person to actually get their system installed and booted into Windows uh, gets to keep the system and the other one has it ripped from their hands. So... That that will be an interesting, exciting thing to watch, probably as they race race forward to do that. So, hardware gods give, and the hardware <laughs> gods. Pay. Yep. Thus it has been. Thus it always shall be at QuakeCon. And if you should happen to see Ryan or any of the rest of the PC Per crew at QuakeCon, do not hurl yourselves at their feet begging for hardware. It doesn't work usually. No. 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 It doesn't. Um. Should we start with reviews or should we talk news? What do you want to start with this week? I, it's, it's up to you. We'll just start at the at the review side. I don't think it was a, it was a rather slow week in yeah. hardware. Well, it, part of the reason I thought like, oh, should we start with that? Because I was laughing as uh, uh, PC World and several other outlets reported that Vizio is rethinking their PC mm -hmm. strategy. So Vizio, Vizio actually, I think, horrified the entire PC industry when they were like, we're going to move from the HCTV world to the world of uh, laptops and desktops because there's more margin there. And like, you know, Dell and Lenovo and HP and everybody else looked at each other and said, good Lord, how awful is the, the HCTV market if they think we have a lot of margin <laughs> compared to the HCTV market. 
And now Vizio, which has been fantastically successful in the ACTV market, is apparently giving up uh, on the, the the laptop and tablet market. Um, basically, you know, they're leaving the web pages up for support purposes, but you can no longer uh, buy uh, Vizio's uh, Windows boxes. Uh, and apparently none of the stuff they showed off at CES is going to ship this year, um, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, I feel bad because uh, Vizio actually, uh, you know, I, I spent a bunch of time with one of their all-in-one desktops and it's a fantastic design. It's a good looking piece of hardware. The performance was solid. It wasn't loaded with cruftware and it was all in all a really good start uh, for a company that was doing something that's much more appliancey than a PC, although you could argue that PCs are much more, you know, thanks to the work of Intel and others, uh, much more instant on and, and, and kind of, you know, living room ready. Uh, but you actually posted an article, uh, Jeremy wrote this up for PC per that the PC is not dead uh, despite the two year slump, which apparently started uh, the minute Vizio uh, entered the market. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, you go, your camera slipped down a little bit. Um, Sorry about that. Yeah, the, the, the PC not dead thing is, you know, people have been talking about it for a long time. And then you have that bad news from somebody like Vizio. Yeah, mostly cell phone vendors. <laughs> yeah. But I actually liked what Vizio was doing in some of their designs as well. They even made like a gaming laptop that I thought was really good. And it was aggressively priced, but maybe it was too aggressively priced as it turned out. Um, but Jeremy posted a story that looked at uh, an article from the register that's quoting Gartner about, um, you know, they expect to see slow but consistent PC growth as emerging markets augment their low-cost tablets uh, and instead to purchase full PCs. And you can see there in some of that chart, right, you've actually seen we're looking at a tenth of a percent growth from second quarter 2013 to second quarter 2014, uh, even yeah. though we've seen drastic market share changes of the company like Lenovo that went up 15% or Dell that went up 12%. But you look at Acer who went down seven and, and everybody else that kind of went down 13. Asus, another big winner there, up 12% in market share. Um, that's actually, that's, that's impressive, right? Um, mm -hmm. It's, it 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 means that you know i don't i don't want to say 10% is a growth trend right or i'm sorry not 10% 0.1% a tenth of a percent is growth right. but it's definitely not the demise of the pc industry and uh you know it's relevant as we're at quakecon because you see like the energy and the excitement of 2,200 people who are building their own computer and bringing it into, uh, you know, the exhibit halls here. And they're, they're gaming for Thursday and Friday and Saturday all through the day, all through the night. Um, and you see the, the, how busy the exhibitor hall is with all the sponsors and, and the interest there, it's there. And I don't think, I don't think it, was ever, it ever really went away. I think the, right the mirage of the tablet taking over the PC um, <laughs> was, was like manufacturer induced or media induced well, rather, rather than an actual thing. Well, I, I don't know how it's, it much of it supplement. was. Well, yeah, I think it's supplement or maybe a lot of people who might've bought a new laptop in the last year or two bought a tablet instead. And that probably delayed the purchase of a new laptop or a new desktop, right? Cause gamers are a relatively small percentage of the market, but you know what I mean? Like, I think we've gone from like, you know, double digit, you know, it's been a long time since we've had you know, sort of double digit year over year growth anywhere in the PC market. Like I think the last place it was still uh, happening uh, in any volume was several years ago. And that was in the sort of over 65 market where all these people who had really never had much use for computers were suddenly discovering computers and becoming very computer literate and then demanding more power and buying more systems. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, in one sense, you know, in terms of, a lot of the the emerging markets, it's always been like, well, cell phones are affordable, cell phones are available, cell phones have, you know, wireless connectivity and the internet built in, and that's going to be the future. No one's ever going to buy another laptop or desktop. And then they turn around and find out, well, may, maybe they are. It's also interesting because Chromebooks seem to be a really big deal, primarily in the educational market and to a lesser degree um, in the, uh, you know, certain sort of enterprise business markets because it allows so much control over the system or central control over the system compared to the relative hackability of a Windows machine. So I think there's a lot going on and a lot of silicons still being sold, which is my indelicate segue to Intel. <laughs> <laughs> Intel still making money? 
Uh, apparently, they're making quite a bit of money. Um, <laughs> Hence the so, Scrooge McDuck picture. <laughs> You know, we get a lot of use out of that picture. Uh, every every time there's an Intel reports call, it feels like we're using that. So apparently over the course of just three months, you know, second quarter, they sold $8.7 billion in PC hardware. And uh, they had a $3.7 billion profit on that $8.7 billion. That's a huge profit margin for them. They made right. $3.7 billion in the quarter, in the second quarter, which is like the slowest quarter, right? Like, isn't that... You know, it doesn't include back to school. It doesn't include Christmas or holiday. Um, it's generally one of the slower periods, and they were still mm -hmm. able to push out a huge amount of profit. Uh, the only thing that was, you know, not entirely unexpected was that their uh, mobile division uh, actually lost $1.1 billion that quarter. Um, so think of it as the cell phone tablet group right. spending more money than they're making. But even with that $1.1 billion division loss, Overall, the company made 3.7. Um, it, it's kind of hard that's to basically, fathom that. Well, it's also, I mean, that's desktops, that's laptops, that's whatever else. They're, you know, Servers, Xeon boxes, yep. that's Mac Pros, that's, you know, MacBooks. I mean, it's, it's really funny, but it's mm -hmm. like, it's not their mobile division that's making it's not like oh well you know this the the intel cell phones have come online and that's where the money's coming from no this is all the stuff that everybody says is dead it may be dead but intel seems to have found a way to make it work um mm -hmm. it's a lot of money man <laughs> i just want i just want a little bit i just just a little just a little. some right Says the man with thirty thousand odd dollars worth of hardware scattered around the room around him that he'll be giving away this weekend at QuakeCon exactly. Dallas. QuakeCon, QuakeCon, QuakeCon at Dallas, 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 Texas, 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 Texas. Um, <laughs> Corsair Graphite Seven Sixty T Full Tower Windowed Case Review. I think uh, yeah, Lee wrote this Robotech up at PCPro.com. Corsair, with its never-ending series of new cases, I think we saw 27 new cases from Corsair at CES. I'm exaggerating. Uh, Just every motherboard though. manufacturer had 27 new motherboards uh, for, the, for the new chips from Intel, which is maybe why there's so much money going around. Um, but there's the 760T Black with red LED fans, 760T Arctic White, which sounds like a color for a 1970s convertible. Uh, with the white LED fans, um, full tower enclosure, um, mini ITX up to extended ATX and XL ATX form factors. Should you still be able to find an XL ATX motherboard for sale uh, anywhere in the world? Um, <laughs> I, li I like the list of key features. Stylish, elegant design with swing outside panel doors. And I got to say, I like swing outside panel doors. Uh, full tower enclosure, 240 LED intake fans, 140 millimeter exhaust fan, built-in two-speed fan controller, kind of the standard, you know, relatively high-end case list. You know, eight case fans, 120 millimeter, 240 millimeter, 360 millimeter radiators for water cooling, drive cage systems. <laughs> Random photo from the window. Uh, three external five and a quarter inch drive bays, six internal three and a half inch drive bays, four internal two and a half inch SSD drive bays. Should you need four SSDs, they have you covered. Sure. Um, mesh dust filters, which I really like uh, on the front panel under the PSU. Uh, external I.O. panel with two USB 3.0 and two USB 2.0 ports. I could go on uh, for a really long time. Um, and did Lee basically test it with both air cooling and water cooling? Did he get that in depth with it? Yeah. Yeah. He, His he cable into, management is beautiful, by the way. <laughs> yes. He is very, very particular about that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> yeah. He, he installed it with uh, water cooling options and air, just you know, kind of standard air cooling options. Um, mm -hmm. My, f It's got a ton of space in it. Uh, the, the doors on it are, as you said, the swinging out doors, they're actually, they're removable too. And... Um, they're really, really nice to build in because you can kind of take that door off even when it's on its side. You can swing it open and, and take it off. And even when it's closed, this is, I don't know if you remember, it's like almost entirely window on that side. Uh, and it makes it very easy to see what's in there. So if you have, if you want to build a, like a nice looking system as well, if you wanted to do a, a, uh, you know, modded rig, this is a good baseline case for that. Um, because the window will allow you to close it and still see all of the work that you're doing on the inside. Um, it's, it's, it's really, really super nice. Um, 
it's it's a, it's relatively inexpensive kind of ish. It's like 180 bucks or so, um, but it has room for a ton of water water cooling hardware in there. Yeah, you can see there at the top where they specifically left room for radiators up top. <clears throat> I think the um, only slight negatives Lee had here was that the, the that that large acrylic side window can scratch. You know, if you're not mm -hmm. careful with it, it's not like it's made out of glass or sapphire or something like that. So you do have to be a little bit careful with it. it, it uh, and the external water cooling knockouts on the back panel leave sharp edges if you remove them and they don't include any kind of like rubber grommets. And sharp edges with water cooling tubes is usually not a great mix. Yeah. And I, I, I will <laughs> say, uh, I will say, you know, if you're paying 190 bucks for a case, it is okay to be upset with sharp edges uh, on the knockouts. Yeah. Um. Yeah. <laughs> I will say, so... My first, this is like the we got here yesterday afternoon. The, this is like the first full day at uh, uh, with uh, the BYOC up and running, and it's interesting the the sheer number of cases that I see that are Corsair cases of you know they've been out for a while now, but of the varying generations is kind right. of astounding to me how how high of a percentage of these cases are actually Corsair cases out there um they they kind of came into the market that was dominated by all kinds of major players that had been in there for decades and and laid waste to them apparently this is based solely on my experience walking around a 2200 spot byoc it's it's pretty interesting um and it's they have a lot of different options now we've seen from their mini itx options to their their like 900d and then to like this this case the 760t where they have a lot of different aesthetics they have a lot of different feature sets um i'm excited you remember, did you did you see like the really tiny 380t yes. from ces that's like the size of like a little portable cooler yeah I think those it are going to be like coming out size of igloo cooler no that that yeah. was actually my favorite case they had on display there and they had a lot of cases on display um um, yeah. I like a compact case. I also, you know, maybe building, I'm, I'm kind of trying to try to decide if I can build a $300 gaming PC or a 400 and change as the cutoff, uh, you know, where 400 and change means you pretty much just, well, yeah, it starts getting like, you can eliminate the cost of the case either by like, you know, buying a case used or scrounging one or, or screwing all of your components to a, you know, piece of board. Um, <laughs> It gets just nailing it in. Yeah, I try not to nail motherboards. Uh, if you nail you know, it through the hole I th where the screw should go, that'll yeah. be fine, right? You just get some finishing it's, nails and tap it through and be good. The the problem isn't the nailing. The problem is when you miss the nail with the hammer. <laughs> the That's whole, whole the whole you know screwdriver thing tends to be a little less uh, traumatic to motherboards in event of user failure stuff but uh, editor's choice on that case from lee and uh uh yeah another fine case from a long line of fine cases from corsair asus z97 ws motherboard review i thought the 97 series was dead to us like aren't we all about 99 now or am i just you know nope. I, I should nope. i should also the point out that it's not out yet Okay, because because I, I was gonna say I should also point out that, that we finished up a Ditrine episode that involved putting bedliner in my truck today. So I've been dealing with a lot of insane chemical, well, insane chemical fumes. So if I look like I'm I'm you know a little twitchier than usual, uh, or or maybe that I've accelerated you know memory loss, that that could be part of it. Um, <laughs> fortunately, we were outdoors and I was wearing a respirator for most of it, but still, it's Smart. amazing. Uh, uh, what solvents uh, will do to you when you breathe them in. So, you know, the Z97 is essentially the one that's working with the Haswell processors. 99, I always keep, I keep thinking because we've been seeing so many announcements with the Rumors 99 motherboards. And, yeah, yeah. 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 You know, you know, and because we, we've and, actually got a lot of questions here last night about the X99 platform. Should they wait mm -hmm. and all that stuff? But well, should they wait? Uh, I'll give the same answer I gave to the <laughs> to the gentleman that I asked yesterday, which was he he was on a Core i7 930, right? Mm -hmm. So that's very similar to what you have or had. Uh, and and I said if if your goal is to keep the system for that same length of time, mm -hmm. then then maybe you wait for X99. You're gonna have to have a larger right. upfront investment because the motherboards are gonna be more expensive, the processors are gonna be more expensive, the DDR4 memory is gonna be more expensive, um, but if you want to spend less money and maybe 
want to upgrade on a more frequent basis than every six years or five years or however long that's been, you know, the, the, the Z97 is still the best platform available today. And it still has a, a, a ton of options along with it, right? And we've seen a lot of cool features. Um, for example, like this WS board, the, this, the WS stands for workstation, um, but a lot of uh, high-end gamers are going to buy this because as of right now, this is the only Z97 motherboard that has a uh, support for quad SLI and quad crossfire through full oh, wow. speed PCI Express by eight ports. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of like the the standout feature to this particular motherboard. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the workstation class, you know, it, it doesn't have the the style of some of the other Asus motherboards. It's a little bit more muted, a little bit more tame. Um, some people may like that. Some people may think that that's, you know, not the motherboard you put for, for high-end GTX 780 Ti's in or something like that. <laughs> um, but they... They integrate 12,000 hour rated capacitors onto the board. It's the first motherboard to ever have anything like that right. on it. Um, you know, the, the workstation board goes through a little bit higher uh, validation program, higher class validation program at ASUS as well. Um, which, like and there's, they say, over a thousand accessories are tested with the board and board stability um, <laughs> before, you know, certification occurs. So that's... That's pretty impressive, pretty impressive metric. Yeah. Dual Intel NICs, like these are some of the features that workstation people may be more interested in than gamers. Right. But this is this is absolutely a motherboard that can be used by gamers that, you know, are looking for that particular feature, the quad GPU support. I mean, it's a it's a two hundred and eighty seven dollar motherboard, and it's kind of nice mm -hmm. if they're going a little deeper than the gold plated accents on the heat pipe um, <laughs> around the CPU and and the chipset. But I mean, at some point, like twelve thousand hour capacitors. What's the last time you had a capacitor die on a motherboard? I mean, is it over? I don't think very long. It's... Yeah. Well, I, I think it's been a long time. Yeah. 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 So I mean, you know, it's uh, there's you know there's a, it's kind of funny. It's like there's a thin line between you know luxurious and workmanlike, and and I think the gold plated accents are a hint towards the luxurious. I mean, uh, you know, uh, it's also kind of funny. As expensive as two hundred eighty seven dollars might seem, take a look at the latest round of Mac Pros, um, <laughs> and consider you know the expandability on those versus the expandability on this. And all of a sudden, uh, uh, it doesn't seem like a particularly stiff price at all. Um, performance was excellent. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it seems like everything was solid with this and it's, but it's, it's definitely, I mean, it's a high end board. If you are going to actually run four GPUs simultaneously, because you have all of the money and a desperate lead for all of the performance. Um, if you are looking for workstation level quality, I, you know, and I will say, I, I kind of like the gold accents and I'm always a big fan of giant capacitors. <laughs> well, these aren't actually giant, but they're giant nice lifespan. Capacitors. We'll go with yeah. the giant lifespan. <laughs> What's the now, warranty I, I, on this? Uh, what does it say? Um, is it listed on there? I think that the standard warranty is two years, three years on these boards. Uh, I don't. Th it's, actually, it's kind of a surprising addition, right there, is that the workstation class board does not have like a, a higher than average or higher than normal um, uh, warranty on it, right? Um, but I, you know, I think the idea is if you build a little bit higher quality components into it, maybe you do more validation that the need for that warranty or would, would be <laughs> would be lessened. But um, still something to, to keep in mind for sure, because there are some boards, right. if you look at the Gigabyte Black Edition, where I think they have a five-year warranty on their motherboard, which is pretty insane. So... Well, you say insane, I say awesome, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've also had a $300 motherboard lose the magic smoke. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of the warranties on motherboard. Mr. Ryan Shrout wrote up a video perspective on the Corsair Flash Voyager GTX 128 gigabyte SSD based USB 3.0 drive. Is this a big honking SSD with a USB plug on one end? Yes. Well, okay, this is a, a little a tiny nutshell. SSD. Um, well, I remember when 128 gigabytes was big for an SSD? It's not anymore. I should point that not. out. You, We're looking at true. like 400 and change for a badass one terabyte SSD. So let me recalibrate myself and go, so is this faster than a traditional USB thumb drive, given that it's a SSD USB thumb drive rather yes. than flash memory? Okay. There we so go. So it's a... 
It's it's uh, available in 128 and 256 gig capacities. It's a USB 3 drive, but it's powered by an SSD controller internally, right? So the SSD controller then bridges over to USB 3. And what's interesting about that is that it gives the USB drive the capability to do some stuff that just your normal USB 3 drives won't be able to do. For example, it can support UASP, which is, I don't remember what it stands for, but it is a technology <laughs> that um, I know for a fact that the Asus Z97 motherboard support, and it basically allows USB to support a SCSI-like command queuing capability that cool. USB in its kind of fault format does not support. So, right, USB in its default format can only do sequential data requests, one by one by one by one, as opposed to what command queuing does is it allows it to queue a bunch of things and do them in the right order so that things happen faster. Um, so as a result, like if you look at the benchmark re uh, results on this, you know, we were mm -hmm. able to get with that feature enabled 460 megabytes per second read and 370 megabytes per second write speeds on, nice. a 200, on, a, on the 128 gig model of this mm -hmm. flash drive. Um, and even if you don't have UASP, you're still talking about 389 megs per second read and 205 megs per second write. And this is all in a, I, I, I thought I brought it with me, but I can't find it. Um, it's all in a, in a thumb drive that you could put on your keychain, essentially. It's a little bit big to put on your keychain, but you can put it on your keychain. Um, it, it's, it's just really cool, right? Uh, yeah. A use case of this would be like you could install a Windows to go installation on this. You could, you can, you can actually, I don't think it does it by default, but you can, you can trick it and install, you can trick the Windows 8 installer and install Windows 8.1 to it and then just boot off of it if you wanted to, right? Maybe you wanted to have a portable operating system, um, you know, in Windows or Linux, for example, even though it doesn't, wouldn't support UASP probably, um, you just be getting fast reads and writes and you have a portable operating system you can take to a bunch of different workstations. Uh, you know, so that is one of those instances where kind of have to have a use case for it, but I still think there's a lot of people that are just going to want to have a super, super fast thumb drive sitting around for those types of transfers. It's a little bit pricey though. It is, it is a little bit pricey. Um, the 128 gigs, $120. And the 256 gig is 199. So if you look at the higher capacity, you're talking about 73 cents per gigabyte, which is eh, it's within reasonable <laughs> range for an SSD as it is now. Um, yeah. And so you're getting that SSD essentially in a smaller package um, that operates on a different uh, interface. So it's it's pretty interesting. I, I I actually liked it a lot. I. I'm not sure how successful they'll be because of that price. And people are just kind of, they're just kind of used to finding the cheapest USB drive that you can find really and going right. with that. And this is definitely not that type of product. <laughs> it's nicer than that. It is. It oh is. My goodness. I don't know. I like speed. The perform. I don't know. The USB 3.0 is getting pretty badass. What was the, it's funny. I feel like I want to do this sort of lightning versus USB 3.0 look at CPU utilization because we keep seeing these insane uh, lightning NAS boxes showing up. I just put out to, uh, according to, uh, uh, well, <laughs> according to Asus, and I guess they should know, the Z97 motherboards, um, all Asus Z97 motherboards include a three-year warranty. In addition, the Z97 Pro and above qualify for Asus premium service with complimentary mm -hmm. advanced replacement during the first year if problems arrive. So, so I right. just wanted to share that because I was kind of like, what is the warranty on that one? Uh, a couple interesting new products from the the, the low end sort of microcontroller end of things. Um, we actually have one of the new Raspberry Pi Model B Plus boards coming in, and it's exciting because it's a new Raspberry Pi board, and we love playing around with those. Um, it's a little less exciting because we were kind of expecting a new processor on that, and there wasn't. It's thirty five bucks. Uh, mm -hmm. And essentially a new layout. So uh, the GPIO header is now up to 40 pins. It'll still be compatible with all the 26 pin uh, GPIO extension boards um, from the Raspberry Pi, the original Raspberry Pis. There's four USB 2.0 ports, which is awesome. Um, 
because there's just something ridiculous about plugging a hub into a Raspberry Pi. Um, they dump the SD socket for a micro SD card. Uh, they've reduced the power consumption by about a half a watt, which is essentially a 50% reduction. Um, and they have a low noise power supply for the audio circuit, and they've kind of cleaned up the layout. So uh, the USB connectors are at the board edge. They put the composite video around in a different place and cleaned it up. So it's going to require new cases, um, but it, the idea is that they're going to have more, uh, uh, a little more sophisticated expansion and, um, you know, some of the ports you need. Uh, mm. A lot of people have been talking about, we've been trying to get one in and we just ordered one uh, and the uh, solid run came out with uh, the humming board, which is essentially a Raspberry Pi competitor. Uh, open source uh, basically mimics the physical form factor of the Raspberry Pi, um, but there are two or three different versions of it. So uh, uh, Tim Vary wrote this up for PC Per. Um, so they have the carrier board that hosts all the I.O. ports and the pinouts, and then a, quote, removable micro SOM or silicon on module, which is a smaller board that houses the processor and the system memory. Um, and I thought they were offering three of these for sale, not two. Um, where did it go? Where did it go? I don't know. <laughs> You're like, man. So if you go to solid-run.com slash product slash humming board, um, there you go. The humming board I1, the humming board I2, and the humming board ITEX, which uh, the EX and the I2 both have a faster processor. It's interesting, right? Because you, you start looking at these, and they're anywhere from like 50 to 100 $106, I think. And, you know, just yesterday, before I was applying all of that bed liner, I swear I knew all of this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, there it is. Okay, so the, the i.mx6 Solo has 5 or 12 megabytes of memory. The dual light has 1 gigabyte. Uh, the, the higher end dual board has 1 gigabyte. Um, it's a 32-bit processor on the least expensive board, 64-bit. Uh, um, with running at like 800 megabits per second for the in the memory config mm. for the faster board, then going up to uh, 1066 for the fastest board they build. Um, GC880 on the lower end board, GC2000 on the higher end board. It's interesting, like, you know, they've got a video uh, decoder and encoder built in. Um, and then there's just a whole bunch of expansion options and gigabit Ethernet on the higher end board. So if you were like, this is really gosh. Cool. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. So, like, if you were thinking, like, I, I like the idea of a Raspberry Pi sync box, but I don't have enough bandwidth for my for 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 my network. That Hummingboard uh, I2EX starts looking really interesting. Um, but it also, I want to say, it's do 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 do. This is the part where I try to go back and find the price. Mm. Um, <laughs> uh, I saw that. I saw that as a second ago as well. It is like the high end board. Yeah, hundred to one hundred and twenty bucks. So it's, not too it's interesting. Bad. I mean, no. it's more than a Raspberry Pi, but yes. But then again, a good night out at a bar is probably more than a Raspberry Pi, and actually, three people at <laughs> McDonald's or In and Out Burger is probably more than a Raspberry Pi, yeah. which is part of the Raspberry Pi's appeal. Yes. All right. Twitch, TWICH at twit.tv is the email address if you want to send us an email at Ryan Shroud at Patrick Norton if you want to get your Twitter on. And we have questions. And, um, uh, First question is from someone who is unnamed. Yeah, um, I, sorry. I just, I, for some reason, left all the emails off of them here. You'll know who you are when we read questions. Sorry. We don't love you any less. <laughs> um, So-and-so writes, first off, I absolutely love the show, and I listen to each and every week. Uh-oh. I currently have a full-tower gaming rig with a Core i7-3770K, Sabertooth Z77 motherboard. Yes, the one with the thermal armor. 16 gigs of RAM and an EVGA 4 gig GeForce GTX 680 graphics card. Yes! I love it when somebody writes in and their GPU isn't as powerful as mine because everybody who wrote in for like two years had a better GPU than I did. But now I have a better GPU, and life is good. Nameless wants to move his primary gaming into the living room, so he's been looking at a new building, a mini ITX system, which I will put my GTX 680 into and turn my current gaming rig into a multi-purpose server that will need a decent amount of horsepower. My question is, should I bring over my processor along with my graphics card and get a new processor for the server, or should I get a new processor and motherboard for mini ITX build? If the latter, which motherboard and processor would you guys recommend? Keep in mind, this mini ITX system will only be for gaming, and I'm not partial to either AMD or Intel. I just want to keep the mini ITX build price as low as possible. Thanks for any advice you guys can give, and keep up the awesome work. 
Um, hmm. I have a thought. Okay. I have my thought I'm before you answer because one of the things I really like about uh, the Haswell boards, um, the Haswell chips, is the reduced power consumption, which mostly we notice in laptops because it's like <gasps> suddenly there's like 50% more battery life. But that also means you're consuming a lot less power for things that are on 24-7. For example, your server box. Um, a Core i7-920, which is ridiculously powerful for a service box, even though it's a relatively old processor, you know, the downfall of that is it generates a metric ton of heat if I put it in a closet, and it generates a metric, well, it sucks down a fair amount of electricity. Now, in the larger sense of things, you know, leaving on a 100-watt light bulb is going to consume almost as much electricity as that Core i7-920, but by reducing the power consumption and reducing the amount of heat generated, it's just better for the environment, it's better for the computer, it's better for wherever you have it stashed. So I would be tempted to, you know, if you're happy with the quality of the gaming experience on your current rig, turn that into your your home theater PC or your your home theater gaming rig, um, or your gaming rig that's attached to your you know uh, 1080p television, and maybe you know do the mini ITX build and build that around the lowest possible power consumption. Uh, you know, so that you have a system that also has the latest options in terms of maybe uh, conserving power and 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 kind of. Am I making sense, Ryan, or am I just kind of no, chasing actually, no. twelve dollars no, less I, a year in electrical bills? <laughs> I mean, he, he, I I think um, the, you know the difference between a Core i seven thirty seven seventy K and something right. like a forty. Seven seventy k is going to be, you know, mostly minimal, especially when it comes to gaming. So there's no reason you can't just take over your processor and your GPU. Um, you'll have to get a new mini ITX motherboard, obviously, and then I think you could reuse your Sabertooth Z seventy seven board with maybe, uh, you know, a little bit slower processor if you want, like a thirty five hundred. 3570 or something like that, something that's quad core, but maybe it doesn't have hyper threading. Right. And uh, add that in to make your file server or your, your server. He does mention that um, he says that the server will need a decent amount of horsepower, but I don't really know why. Because right. if you're serving files, yeah, like I guess maybe. Yeah. But even then, 3570 is going to be plenty of, of, power of power for any kind of real time <laughs> transcoding you're going to be doing. Right. Um, Maybe he's real-time transcoding for 17 people simultaneously. That could be it, in which case you guys are going to need a lot more horsepower. Um, right. You know, and if he doesn't, if he doesn't need a GPU, just use the integrated graphics on, you know, the Ivy Bridge part and you'd be okay as well, right? So I, I, would, I would probably just take the processor um, <clears throat> and the graphics card because you could probably find a whole bunch of Z87 mini ITX motherboards out there. Uh, that may be even a little bit less expensive now that the Z97s are starting to come out and even those mini ITX boards starting to filter up. Right. But I think you'll find better selection with the Z87, Z77 lineup there. So that would cool. be my recommendation as well. Yeah. A good recommendation. I like it. <laughs> Email says, I recently upgraded my computer system and moved to a mini ITX-based system. I ran into a problem of not having enough fan connections on the motherboard. There are only enough connections for the CPU and one case fan. I have two more case fans to power. All external drive bays and PCI slots are full. I was wondering if you could recommend an automatic fan controller that would adjust the speed of my fans based on temperature, but can be mounted completely internally. Any suggestions you have? Are greatly appreciated, um, you know. And we should point out you can get adapters that will turn a standard Molex plug, like that would go into the back of an old school three and a half inch hard drive, into the connectors for your fans. Um, and you can run a whole lot of fans off of a couple of those. Um, do you have a particular yeah. fan controller you like? So I guess I, I I like there are a lot of fake controllers I like, but I don't know of any that are completely internal, right? All the ones oh, really? um, that I, like they're, they take up a five and a quarter inch bay or something like that, right? And they've got all of their controls that mm -hmm. way. Um, I'm really surprised that uh, a motherboard like that FM2 A88X only has two right. uh, fan connectors, which is a little bit surprising. I'd expect it to have at least three, but we would still have the same issue, but um with one fan instead of two. Uh, I think there are some devices out there that you can get to split the um, fan connectors into two, right? right? You, you, yeah, can't I mean, just, you can't just use wires for that because it's got to be smart enough to know how to control right. it. Um, but you'd have two fans running at the same speeds. 
right? Because he does kind of say that that's a requirement is he wants ones right. that will adjust the speed of my fans based on temperature. The I mean, only benefit to that is with a mini ITX case, the temperatures are going to be relatively similar all throughout right. the entire <laughs> of it. So the fans all spinning at the same speed yeah. should be okay. Yeah, it's funny because I'm up on frozencpu.com. And of course, there's like, you know, $2.50 for a three pin Y cable splitter. Um, you know, that'll basically do what Ryan was just describing, run two fans off of a single header on the motherboard. Um, but yeah, it's funny. Like you start looking at all of the, I don't think there's, I don't think I'm finding a single, um, just, you know, sort of discrete fan controller that isn't like 40 or 50 bucks and require a five and a quarter inch bay. Yeah, because most of the time can... you're, you're looking for a fan controller that you can interact right. with, right? you know, externally. Um, it, you know, it would be good. I, I, there might be one that exists and I just don't know what it is that uh, essentially is like a little controller inside that connects to your motherboard through USB mm -hmm. and then it's controlled through software. Right. Um, I know Corsair well, does also, that with their power supplies and stuff. You, you could also buy one of the ones designed to go in a five and a quarter inch drive and cut as much of the five and a quarter inch drive bay mounting stuff off of it and just stuff it inside of your case. Um, mm -hmm. Not particularly sophisticated, but you know, <laughs> but, you know, if it yeah. fixes your problem, it fixes your problem. Um, I, I, yeah, I would funny. try the splitter method. Um, do a little research and make sure yeah. that like uh, splitting it is cutting the amperage probably yeah. over that line. So what do you have to adjust or change in the, in the bias to support that? Is that even like, can Possible. you do that? Uh, because if you've got, there might be something that can do like, it'll, like you maybe it will, maybe it's got like a little adapter that is powered by a four pin Molex, but actually is just amplifying the three or four pin connection through it. So it's still getting the communications through it as well. Uh, and actually that might be another option is I know that there are Molex fan power adapters that will let you uh, like power the fan through the Molex connection, the four pin Molex, and then have, you know, a little three pin mount that just has one wire coming into it for the feedback to the motherboard and mm -hmm. then plug that into one of those splitters that way. And that might work. <laughs> so you can daisy chain things, which gets complicated in a mini ITX system. Um, but you could probably do it. It's kind of crazy. So I'm, I'm, I'm also, you know, uh, I'm, I've, I'm now completely in the weeds, deep, deep in the dark corners of frozencpu.com. And it's like, you know, uh, PCI slot, you know, fan power splitters, fan power splitters that'll take like a 12 volt feed off of your power supply and break it down into multiple 10 volt, 8 volt, 6 volt, 5 volt ports. It's kind of crazy once you start how many different, uh, you know, power distribution blocks there are just for fans and such, um, multi-fan ports, but a fully automatic fan controller that takes up no space inside of your case. It's really hard to find. Well, it's funny, right? You're laughing, but it's like, you know, you know, touch panel, multifunction fan controller, temperature sensor, LCD display. And, you know, it's like, really? Like, because I, I need, you know, I'm staring at a monitor. Do I really need an LCD flat panel on the front of my case to demonstrate, <laughs> you know, to, to list the temperature information? I mean, remember the worst of the car stereos and, you know, a few years ago where it looked like a light show had exploded in your dashboard? A lot right. of the design aesthetic here is is that. And a lot of these are, it's funny, a lot of these are, are manual. They're not automatic temperature sensing. They're not totally doing the controls on them. Um, and then we got to water blocks and I closed the window because whenever I look at water blocks, I end up uh, spending a lot of money. <laughs> Don't go there then. Don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah, I have a truck to finish. I have children to feed. One more email before we go and get Ryan back to QuakeCon. Hello, Patrick and Ryan. Your show is awesome, and thank you for all the years of great shows and advice. Thank you. I have built several gaming machines using your site as a knowledge base, and they are running great. Can I mix video great. cards brands with no performance issues? I have an opportunity to get a PNY Accelerator 8 GeForce CTX 770 OC 2 Gigabyte GDDR5 PCI Express 3.0 Graphics Card Enthusiast Edition. A friend of mine has a newer used card, a new never used card for sale, 200 bucks. Um, you could certainly use an AMD and an NVIDIA card in the same system at the same time, except you can't use them together to play accelerate a 3D game. Um, yes. could you even get Actually, could you even get both sets of drivers to boot without causing the machine yeah. to work? 
Yeah, Windows uh, 7, starting with Windows 7 and Windows 8, you can actually run multiple driver, uh, graphics drivers uh, at the same time. So they would be able to operate at the same time. Um, it, I don't know if he's talking about video card brands as in GPU brand, though, or just like oh. he has another GTX 770 right. from like EVGA or somebody like that. And if, you, if that's the case, you definitely can. As long for, so here's how, in NVIDIA, they have to be matched GPUs perfectly. GTX 770 with GTX 770, you know, 680 with 680, 780 with 780. Uh, as, but as long as they are the same GPU, they don't have to run at the same clock speed. They don't even technically have to have the same size frame buffer, same memory on them. Although you are kind of sacrificing the additional memory of the larger capacity card. Um, on the AMD side, you can actually, I think you can still like pair 7970 with a 7950 and... You can do that, but you're kind of, again, you're taking that 7970 and limiting it to the performance of the 7950. Um, so you're mm -hmm. not really getting the best scaling you could out of it. Uh, and again, even on the AMD side, the brands don't matter at all. You know, Sapphire, Power Color, HIS, XFX, all of those will work just fine uh, in the same systems together. But if you're talking about AMD with NVIDIA, no, you're not going to get the performance of both of them. But if you really wanted to, you could have both of them in the same system. Right. And I don't know what after that, but you could. You could do that. <laughs> you could. You but why can. would you? Yeah. Uh, I think we're going to call it there. Do you okay. think? Or do you want to do? Or, no, that's fine. You, yeah. We have, we have a really good question. Matt, if you're out there, your question about whiskey and multi bay NASAs, we're going to get that we'll next week. We'll do that next promise. week. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a couple of things just came out. I want to get some more information on those. Because NASAs, they are fascinating and they're complicated. And I just want to say a lot of there's a lot of them. And sometimes <laughs> the cheapest one is not the bargain, it seems. Because nothing says hell like finding out you've lost 12 terabytes of something. Um, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Ryan knows that pain. <laughs> don't don't lose data. It's not a good idea. Yeah, it takes a long time to back all that stuff up to crash plan. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> Twitch at twit.tv is the email address. At Patrick Nord at Ryan Sprout is where you can find us on the Twitters. If you're in Texas or can drive yourself to Dallas and you want some free hardware, go hunt. Hunt, hunt Ryan Shrout down, I say. Do not bother him at the show. Just find out where he's going to be giving away hardware at the show and, and then go yell and scream and beg there. And uh, that's, that's what they it do. for this. That's what we're for. I, I should say, is is everybody down at QuakeCon? Is anybody back at the ranch filing stories at this uh, point? We have a couple of people still out uh, doing that, but we've got Ken and Josh and Alan are all here. Uh, cool. with this as well. Need as many people you as guys... possible to help hand out all this hardware. <laughs> Did you guys do the the road trip? Usually you start out this this your your QuakeCon episode of yep. Twitch going, I spent 14 hours in the car and I ate everyone. <laughs> so uh, Alan and Ken and Matt drove my truck down. I flew in from San Francisco because I was in meetings in San Francisco before. So I flew straight. I flew from San Francisco to Dallas. I will be driving back with them on Sunday, though. So I'll get I'll get my 15 hours in the car. I'll get. There. I would I would be hurt that you were in San Francisco. And didn't tell me, but I literally have driven almost 600 miles in the last seven days doing shoots for work. Well, uh, I was in San Francisco for such a short amount of time that I was checked in for my departure flight before my arrival flight landed. So <laughs> there's that. <laughs> yeah. That sounds like a fascinating story and probably not one we'll ever talk about on the show. Yeah, indeed. Secret stories. Ladies and gentlemen, that's it for this episode of Twitch. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Trout. We'll see you next week.